those songs for months to come in the, with the CD in your cars. God bless you. Uh, but I really appreciate all the work at Bible school this week. Um, I'm going to change gears significantly a bit. Um, in the Constitution, after the big preamble, which I know as a song, thank you, Schoolhouse Rock, um, after the preamble, there are, there are three articles, and they all start the same way, pretty much. Article 1 starts, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Article 2 starts, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. And Article 3 says, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. They liked that frame, ordain and establish. Constitution. Those three sentences really describe what the founders thought would be a great way to balance leadership in our nation, give a set of checks and balances. The framers understood that really our, our nation would rise or fall based on how it was led. I mean, that's really a simple fact, right? Human organizations need leadership, and human organizations often fail because either the leaders or the leadership structures are bad. So when God created a people, when he put together his New Testament people, the church, he, he also established leaders in his church and defined what leadership would look like. Uh, remember, we're, we're in 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 4 this morning. So you won't get to open your Bible there. But <clears throat> the big issue that Paul has been addressing all the way through the, these first few chapters is division, and it's really division focused on leadership. Some guys were saying, I'm of Paul. Some were saying, I'm of Cephas. Some were saying, I'm of Apollos. Others were saying, hey, I'm, I'm a red-letter Jesus guy. Well, two weeks ago, we looked at how Paul addressed one problem behind this division. The real problem, he said at this point, he said that the problem is you're using worldly wisdom to think about things. You're thinking about things the way the world thinks about things, not the way the church should. Well, this morning we're going to see there's another problem that, that lies behind all of this. The fact is they're also not understanding leadership the way God defined leadership for the church. As so we look at Paul's words to his church on this matter of leadership this morning, we're going to be called maybe even to rethink our own ideas about leadership in the church. But we can't really stick with that generic idea of leadership here. I mean, it sounds like I'm some sort of self-help guy showing up at your corporation to talk to you about leadership. The men Paul is talking about in this passage, the men that the church finds itself dividing over these are leaders with something in common. Every one of these leaders is one who brings the word of God to the people of God. That defines their role of leadership. They are leaders who are to bring the word of God to the people of God. These men find their, themselves in a list that Paul gives in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Paul lists there, he says, God gave these gifts to the church. He says he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, in our day, there are no more apostles or prophets. These men were men who received a direct, thus saith the Lord, from God to give to the people. We, that's why their names head so many of our books in the Bible. Now, the church today does still have evangelists, specifically men who take the word of God to people groups who have never heard the word of God. In our day, we call them missionaries. I believe that's what Paul's talking about there, men who take the word of God to people groups who've never heard the word of God. And the church still has shepherd teachers or pastor teachers. 
And those are men who are entrusted to take the written word of God and to teach it and help the church apply it to their lives. And since the same Paul wrote 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, I think what we can see is the leadership principles we're about to look at in 1 Corinthians 4 apply to leaders who have been entrusted with the word of God. That's who we're talking about here. But now you might be thinking, well, that means there's nothing for me here. I can just go ahead and take a nap. Please don't. Um, I'd rather you didn't. Um, but actually, it's, it's, it's probably not a stretch to say there's something here for those of you who handle the word in Sunday school and teach the word. And it's also worth remembering, Paul's not writing this letter to the leaders. That's not who he's writing to. He's writing to the people who think wrongly about their leaders who teach them in the word. So really, this is a word for everybody, for everybody. With that in mind, I'm going to ask that you would stand once more in honor of God's word. And I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the first five verses. This is God's word. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his condemnation or commendation, excuse me, from God. Father, this is your word. And I pray that you would use it this morning for the good of those who are here, that your word might do its work in their minds and their hearts and for your glory, that as your word does its work, we might live lives that would glorify you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. In this passage, then, Paul reveals, really, three foundational principles of church leadership. Three foundational principles of church leadership for those who handle the word of God. These men are, are called to do a certain task, do it to a certain standard, knowing they will face a certain evaluation. So we're going to look at the task, the standard, and the evaluation of these church leaders. So let's just go ahead and look at that. First of all, Paul informs us that church leaders have the task of gospel stewardship. Church leaders have the task of gospel stewardship. Stewardship. He says this is how you ought to be regarding us or thinking about us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. He says, church, if you want to evaluate my ministry, Apollos' ministry, Cephas' ministry, what you need to do, well, you need to do it this way. You need to first think of us as servants of Christ. First of all, that's how you need to think of those who lead you in the word of God. They serve Jesus Christ. They're not to be men who seek to improve their branding or marketing. They're not the guys who need to have the most popular, popular YouTube site or blog. They're not looking for a fan club. They're not looking to divide up so they can each have their own groupies. They're answering their calling to be servants of Jesus. They're placed in the position of servant to Christ their master. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, they are stewards of the grace of God, stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, steward is a very good term for what these men are doing. A, a steward was somebody who was appointed as a manager. He might have been a household manager. Uh, he might have overseen a family. There could also be government stewards who oversaw parts of government. In the Bible, we've got in First and Second Kings, palace. Stewards, business stewards in Matthew 20, 
city treasury stewards in Romans 16, and a household stewards, perhaps the most famous household steward, is Joseph, who is a steward, a manager over Potiphar's household. Uh, there's also the one who's, who we see in the parable where Jesus turns the water into wine. He deals with the household steward at the wedding feast. Well, Apollos, Cephas, Paul, and everyone else who is a leader who explains the word of God to God's people are stewards of the mysteries of God. Now that phrase, mysteries of God, refers to nothing less than the gospel itself. The, the gospel is the mystery in the Bible. It is the, the secret wisdom of God which they sought to understand in the Old Testament, but which was revealed in Christ Jesus in the New Testament. It, 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 God has then entrusted these men, these leaders who lead with the word of God, he has entrusted them with the good news about Jesus who saves. They're not to proclaim and, and protect other messages. This is the message they are to proclaim and guard is the good news about Jesus Christ. And that was their calling when Paul wrote to this church in Corinth. And it's the calling of preachers, teachers, and missionaries today to proclaim and protect the good news about Jesus Christ. Not, not for their own glory, because it's good news about him, about him for his glory. That means Apollo, Cephas, and Paul are gospel men. And men who lead in the church with the word of God must be gospel men. Church leaders are entrusted with the task of gospel stewardship. Friends, this, really, uh, this understanding of, of leadership in the Word should really destroy celebrity Christianity. That should be an oxymoron to us. How many of you sports fans have posters hanging up in your garage or your bedroom of the water boy or the ball boy? Tommy, do you have one? Tommy doesn't have one. You know why? Because they're servants. They're understood to be servants. How many pianists have you ever seen who had a bust on their piano of their childhood music teacher? I don't know that Mrs. Staley ever had a bust made of herself. You know, you got the little Mozart and the Beethoven bust. And you know why? Because Mrs. Staley was really serving the music of Beethoven and Mozart by teaching it to a next generation. She was making much of their stuff, not her stuff. And she had to work with me, so God bless her for it. That was not good. Um, friends, stewards and servants don't seek to be celebrities. And they don't become them even if they do. How sad to live in a day if, it, where, if we're honest, we've bought into the idea that there are such things as celebrity leaders in the church. I mean, we collect their books and we read them more than our Bibles. We get t-shirts with their names on them. I saw a church website last Wednesday that described what the church believed by saying, we follow the teachings of, and it listed three current preachers, popular preachers. And when we want to know how to understand a divisive issue, what do we do? We check out the last time they posted a YouTube video. We've lost the biblical understanding that there is only one celebrity in this story. And his name is Jesus. Those who teach and preach his news are teaching and preaching his news to make much of him. Of him. Now, I'm not saying you don't have your favorite teachers out there and you don't read other people's books. That would be silly for a man who has so many books in his office. But what I, I'm saying is that they, they are not who we glorify. We glorify Christ, the one who, who, who left the throne room of heaven, humbled himself by taking on the flesh of his creation, and then allowed his creatures to nail him to the cross to rescue, so he could rescue them from their sins. He is the one we must follow, that we must glorify. So men who lead by, by teaching, proclaiming the word must be gospel men, gospel stewards. Church leaders entrusted with the word have the task of gospel stewardship and they must work to the standard 
of gospel faithfulness. The standard of their performance must be this, gospel faithfulness. He says that they're to be regarded as servants, stewards of the mysteries of God. In verse 2, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful or trustworthy. It is required. It is required. Not optional. It's not just the best we can see. It is required. That is the standard. Gospel faithfulness. Stewards of the gospel must be found as faithful stewards of that gospel. Jesus gave us the, the perfect picture of a faithful steward in Matthew chapter 25. He told the story of a master who left on a business trip and assigned three of his servants as stewards over his wealth. One was left in charge of five talents. That's like 50 years worth of income. Another was left in charge of two talents, like 20 years worth of income. And another one talent, which is 10 years worth of income. So they're all left with a lot. And the Bible says that the five talent, two talent guys went out and they put the money to work and they doubled the money. And the one talent guy got a sack, put his money in it, buried it in the ground and hid it. And the master gets home and he calls them all together to settle accounts. And, and, and the five talent guy and the two talent guy come and they explain what they did. And he says, hey, well done. I'm going to give you a promotion. You're going to get entrusted with even more because you did so well with this. And then the one talent guy comes in and I can imagine him brushing the dirt off the bag of money as he hands it to his, his master. And, and, and the master looks at him and, and he says, Master, I was scared of you. I didn't want to lose anything. So I just put it in a hole in the ground. And his master wouldn't have it. His master said, you are wicked and lazy is what you are. You are wicked and lazy. He took the money from him. He gave it to the other two guys and said, you guys make some money with it. He threw the lazy slave into prison. The Bible says into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Yet two faithful stewards then, two faithful stewards, they used what the master gave them in order to bring more glory to the master. The faithless steward just protected his own hide. His motivation was to, 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 to save himself. Now, Jesus was not teaching his followers about how to handle money. This, there's no investment strategy in Matthew chapter 25. What he's saying is that, that as a matter of fact, if you look at Matthew 25, what he's describing is the difference between sheep and goats is what he's doing. And he's saying that those entrusted with the truth of the gospel, this glorious treasure in the word of God, those entrusted with it are to take it and go do something with it that brings more glory to the author. That's what they're to do. They're supposed to take this treasured gospel and put it to work in the world so that God would be glorified. That lazy and wicked servants take this treasure and they just, they just hide it and say, God, I just wanted to make sure I got there. Okay. See, that's the definition of a faithful steward. You don't just take the gospel for yourself, but you put it to work for the glory of God. That's why word-gifted church leaders must be held to the standard of gospel faithfulness. Now, we need to be careful here. In the parable, the, the master was away a long time, wasn't he? Faithfulness is a long game. We don't just look and judge every up and down every leader has. You know, oh, he preached a bad sermon today. I didn't hear you know, the points I expected to hear. He's obviously a faithless steward. Our, our Sunday school, I can't believe he didn't seem very prepared for the lesson today. He's obviously a faithless steward. It's a long game. It's a long game, and we need to remember that. Second of all, it emphasizes faithful activity, not bean counting results. You notice there's nothing about the guy who doubled five getting more praise than the guy who doubled two. Right? It's just about faithfulness to what God gave you and using it to glorify God. And it always makes me think of William Carey. In 1792, William Carey organized a missionary society, and he said as their standard, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. 
Within a year, he and his family, including his pregnant wife and his children, and a man named Dr. Thomas were on a boat going off to India to reach India for Christ. Well, Dr. Thomas and, and, and William Carey had really no idea of how hard it would be when they got to India. And, and so right away, things went bad. The first years were tough. Dr. Hunt Thomas gave up and he left. Carey had to keep moving from place to place trying to find work to feed his family. They suffered serious illness. Carey summed up the experience. He said, no Christian friend, a large family, and nothing to supply our wants. But a faithful steward, he said, I still have God, and his word is sure. Carey learned Bengali, and he soon got to work translating the New Testament into the language of the people, into Bengali. He preached to small gatherings, even though in, in the British governed part of India he was in, it was illegal for him to preach to the the native Indian people. At this time, Kerry also suffered a disease in the family. He himself caught malaria. His five-year-old son, Peter, died of dysentery. And all that was too much for his wife, and, 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 and she had a mental break. She even tried to stab and kill William Carey. She had to be locked up in a home. Things were going terrible for Carrie. Indeed, he wrote, he said, this is indeed the valley of the shadow of death to me. But in that same writing, he said, I rejoice that I am here notwithstanding because God is here. Finally, in October of 1799, things started to turn. He moved to a Danish settlement in India where it was actually legal for him to preach the gospel. And he got help. A man came who was a printer who got some government contracts so he could fund the ministry. Another couple came, and they were teachers. They set up a school for the kids and, and were getting some kids to come to the school. And Carrie was even able to get a job teaching at a local college in Calcutta. Then, in December of 1800, after seven years of faithful ministry, seven years, he baptized the first convert to Christianity. Seven years one person came to faith. His son died. His wife lost her mind. Seven years, one convert. That is gospel faithfulness. It's faithfulness. William Carey knew he had the only message that would save those people from their sins. And that no one else was going to tell them about this Jesus. So whatever it cost him, he was going to get that gospel to them. It's also what it looks like with, with those mission dignity pictures. Some of those retired bivocational pastors of small rural churches who preach the gospel day in and day out, week in and way out, day, week in and week out, never seen a, a large numerical growth, never seen enough money to pay their bills, much less retire. It's what it looked like for the lady who taught the children Sunday school and backyard Bible club until she just couldn't do it anymore. And then kept trying because she knew those children needed to know the Jesus she knew. Gospel faithfulness is the standard of performance for those church leaders entrusted with the word of God. So they have a task. It's gospel stewardship. And the standard is gospel faithfulness. There's also an evaluation. Church leaders work toward an evaluation that comes from God. Verses 3 to 5 are a little more complicated, but nonetheless very important to understanding church leadership. Paul's already established the standard. I mean, they are to be faithful in handling the word of God. But then he follows up by making sure everybody knows who will be judging these stewards. And you can understand why he would go there in this letter, right? I mean, what the problem is, is that everybody is judging the, those leaders who are bringing the word. Because when they said, I'm of Cephas, they're essentially saying, because Cephas is better than Paul. I'm of Apollos. No, Apollos is better than Cephas. They were sitting there saying that, that we're the ones who will be the judges over these men. You know, I can tell that Paul doesn't quite got it, or Apollos doesn't quite have it. And this guy, Cephas, oh, he's the man. Let's get the t-shirt, right? Uh, the church members were sitting in judgment of these men entrusted with the gospel. And in verses 3 through 5, Paul really condemns them for it. Look at what he says. He says, But with me it's a very small thing 
that I should be judged by you or any human court. Paul says, look, your judgment of me or even a judgment of a human court for or against me is a very, very small thing. But Paul doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't want them to think he's just being arrogant, right, saying, you can't judge me. That's not what he's saying, because then he goes on to say, in fact, I do not even judge myself. For I'm not aware of anything against myself, but thereby I'm not thereby acquitted. In other words, I can't declare myself innocent even though I don't know of anything I've done wrong because I'm not in a position to judge myself. It is the Lord who judges me. When it comes to leading the church through gospel faithfulness, Paul says, you are in no position to judge me. Your judgment is nothing. He says, the courts... Human courts are in no position to judge me. The world's in no position to judge me. Their judgment is nothing. And then he says, I'm in no position to judge me. My own judgment of myself, it is nothing. And therefore, his next command, after he says, only the Lord, only the master can judge the servant. He says in verse 5, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes. Like Matthew 25, the master returns who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and disclose the purposes of the heart. Only the Lord can judge, and he is a perfect judge. He is a perfect judge. They, the, these, these, these ones who lead with the word of God will be judged by the one who sees everything. The judge sees everything. He can even tell what the intent of their heart is. The intent, I mean, they might have taught a doozy of a lesson, but their heart was in the wrong place. He knows. Or their heart was in the right place, but they stumbled over every other word. He knows. And he will judge them at his return. The, the Lord has not commissioned the church to be the judge in the meantime. He will judge them at his return. And they will be judged for the intent of their hearts, and each one then will receive their commendation from God. God will judge. God will judge. And he will judge according to the standard he set forth. Were you faithful with the gospel? And he will judge based on the fact that he knows absolutely everything. And we spend a lot of time in court with a he said, she said, and looking at the evidence and the DNA testing because we don't know everything. God will not need long for his trial. He knows everything. And he will judge the heart of the steward. He will reward the faithful and condemn the faithless. Therefore, church leaders work toward an evaluation that will come from God and God alone. Now, hearing that might leave you a little uncomfortable. You might think, is Paul saying the church should put up with faithless preachers, teachers, and missionaries who mishandle the word of God and the gospel? Is that what he's saying? Well, no. Of course he's not saying that. Remember, Paul wrote letters to Timothy and a letter to Titus about the work they were to do to run false teaching elders out of the church and replace them with better elders. All right? That's kind of here and now. Right? So Paul would not and never would tell the church to put up with false teachers and false te whether they're teachers or Sunday school teachers till Jesus comes. In fact, the Bible really gives congregations ways to deal with elders who are, are in sin. Basically, a little Matthew 18 with a little 1 Timothy 5 stirred in. When, when the church needs to confront sin in their teachers, to practice discipline is something the church is always called to do. However, there's a big difference in confronting sin in the life of the leaders of the church. False teaching, by the way, is sin. In case you thought I was talking about two different things. False teaching is sin, but there's a big difference between confronting sin in the leadership of the church and standing in judgment of the gospel ministry of the leaders of the church. First of all, discipline deals with sins of the moment. Sins of the moment. This is a sin. We want to help you repent of that sin, and if not, we're going to have to deal with that. But, but this judgment that Paul is talking about here is a long-term thing. It is judgment of the entire body of work of ministry of the church leader. Second of all, discipline by the church removes the blessings to bring about repentance and restoration. It says, look, at the very, at the very end of this, the worst church does a discipline. It says, look, we're going to remove you from this fellowship hoping 
the living out in the world will drive you to repentance and restoration. But God's judgment of the minister will not be that way. God's judgment is final. It's the sheep and goat thing. And third, discipline responds to that which can be seen. And God sees everything. The big point to consider here really is simply this. Whether it is the judgment of rebuke or the judgment that, that makes a minister into a celebrity, we must take great care to act as God has directed us to act until the day of his coming and not try to usurp his role as the master and judge in anything. And, and that would apply in our local church, but it's in, in our world where every other pastor in the world is out there for you to listen to somewhere. It would imply the way we talk about other men in ministry, in their ministry. I mean, I think it really applies. To it. We, we need to say, hey, we understand this is a gospel task, and it's about gospel faithfulness, which God will judge. So let's kind of put this all together. Church leaders entrusted with the gospel and the word of God have the task of gospel stewardship they're to perform up to the level of gospel faithfulness, which in the end, God will judge. So as your pastor, I'm going to ask something of you here. Let's, let's be a, a church that is clear on this. We got all these cute, shiny things up here. And this was all about treasure. Let's be a church that's clear on this. The most precious treasure, the most precious commodity, the greatest thing we have as a church is the gospel. It is the good news about Jesus Christ who, who looked upon sinners, cosmic rebels against the righteousness of God. He looked on them and he loved them as an act of pure mercy and grace. And he sent his son. God sent his son to live a perfect life in their place so there would be righteousness and to offer them his righteousness, then take on their sin under the very wrath of the Father on the cross, paying the price in full so that they could be forgiven. Let, let's just be really clear. That is the precious thing we have. That is the thing that we want to, as, as, a, as a body doing ministry, that is the thing we want to be most faithful in, in stewarding. You know, it's important that we have this nice building and we should take care of it. But if we focus more on this building than we do the good news about Jesus Christ, we've lost our way. And we would be unfaithful. I mean, it's just, there's so many things. That, that, that draw our attention and draw our focus. I mean, we can go do good for people, right? We, we could go remodel everybody's house in Thompson Town. We could go feed every kid in Thompson Town. We, we could go do every good thing in the world. But if we forget about the good news that tells us that Jesus saves sinners, we are unfaithful stewards. That is our precious resource and our call is to faithfulness in that and therefore my role and the role of anyone who who teaches in this body is to elevate that to make much of him and, and that is why God gave gifts to his church and describes them as apostles prophets evangelists pastor teachers because that's what we need that's that's where we need lead but even in Ephesians 4.11, if you remember what it says, it says he gave those gifts to the church, not so that they could do it, but so that they could equip the church for the work of the ministry. I mean, my goal here is to help you know your Bible really well so when you pick it up and read it, you understand what you're reading. That's, it's always, that's what I was taught was my goal in preaching from the scriptures. But ultimately, that's not enough. It only becomes enough when you fall in love with the Christ that this entire book is talking about, so much so that you cannot keep quiet about him. And you take this 
treasure from your master and you go out and you do everything you can to see it bear fruit in a lost and dying world. We must not put our leaders up on pedestals or tear them down while they're doing the work of the ministry. Instead, we must seek to encourage them and help them be faithful with the gospel. Which might mean calling them out if they're not. It might mean saying, hey, shouldn't the gospel be the thing today? But that needs to be our focus, the gospel. With that in mind, I would be very amiss to preach such a message and not ask, do you know the Christ of this gospel this morning? Do you know him? Can you say that you understand that by your own works you deserve only the very wrath of God for all eternity, but by the grace of God shown to you in Christ Jesus, by your faith in him, you know you have been rescued. You know that instead of the hell you deserve, you will receive the benefits and the blessings of heaven because you trust in him. Do you know? If you do not know that for certain this morning, let me encourage you, we need to talk. We need to talk more about this Jesus. Or, I mean, maybe you don't need to talk to me. Maybe right now you just need to, to go to the Lord and say, Lord, I understand, I, I believe, and express that faith to him and be saved right now. You can do that. If you call upon the name of the Lord to save you based on the work of Christ, he will save you. Now, Christian... Those of you who have believed, there's definitely a calling for us here too. So this message was about leaders in the church, and that's certainly what Paul was getting at. But we've, every one of us, been entrusted with this gospel. If you believed it, you know it well enough to share it with others so they can believe it. Right? I mean, if you, think, if you say, because I believe this good news about Jesus, I am saved... You obviously believe in something that has content. You believe you, you could tell me what that good news is that you believe that saved you. Well, the good news is not any different that will save anyone else. So let's commit together to being faithful stewards of this good news. Let's commit to taking it out there, not, not digging a hole and burying it just so on the final day we've got it ourselves. But let's, let's take it and take it out there that God may be glorified as it does more and more work in his name. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, you are gracious to your people. You have sent your Son to save. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. But we thank you also that you have entrusted us with the good news of the gospel that you have given us this, this treasure to go share with others. Lord, help us to be faithful. And Lord, for myself, as, as one that Paul is speaking exact, specifically about, God, help me to be faithful. And Lord, I, I, I just pray also that, that within the, this room today, that you might raise up more leaders for your church who would be faithful gospel stewards. I pray for my brother Caleb as he is committing to that. But I pray that you would raise up more missionaries, more preachers from this body. That, that, that we might engage even more in this work of gospel stewardship. And that you might be more and more glorified. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, brother Tom is going to come lead us in our closing hymn. As he does, I would ask that you consider the word of God in your own life this morning. What do you need to do in response to God's word? Maybe you need to repent of something. Maybe God has revealed some sin in your life. Deal with that while we sing. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is your promise this morning if God has revealed sin in your life. Maybe he is calling on you to respond to the gospel today, to believe and be saved, and, and you want to follow him in baptism and unite with the body. 
come forward and share that with us. We want to rejoice with you in that. Or maybe, maybe as you've heard this about gospel stewardship and leadership, you say, I think God's calling me to take that gospel out into a lost world somewhere in ministry or missions. I'd love to share that, share that good news with the church this morning too. So if God's calling you, come and share that. But whatever you do, deal with the word of God today. Please stand.